Dennis Sarfate making his first appearance. What will you do to defend the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Welcome to the Green Dragon Tavern, where we talk a little treason. I'm Zach Lautenschlager. Hey guys, and I'm Dennis Sarfate. House Oversight Committee held a hearing with three former Twitter executives as witnesses and asked, and actually, I'm sorry, that was four, four Twitter ex, former Twitter executives, and asked about the findings from the Twitter files. Um, the entire event was largely an exercise, unfortunately, either in obfuscation or in softball questions from the Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, the change in the room for the, with the Twitter executives as soon as a Democrat uh, asks questions, and of course they alternate between the two, uh, was, uh, was striking. Uh, Dennis, what did you see there? I think the biggest part of it was uh, Jim Jordan bringing up the New York Post article on the Hunter Biden laptop. Jim Jordan asked them, if it didn't violate your Twitter rules, then why did you take it down? New York Post was banned for two weeks. Um, and I think what you're seeing here now is they're starting to reveal layers of where this goes. And he pretty much came out and said, big tech and the federal government are in cahoots together. There was collusion and you were censoring the American people that wanted to hear what was going on. And they, you know, they interfered with an election, whether you believe it or not, they interfere with an election. Well, and I think Byron Donalds proved that uh, in the in the hearing very clearly. Um, mm -hmm. He really was a rock star during that hearing. Uh, he had his stuff together. He had all of the available information that was uh, that was released in the Twitter files on the screen behind him, um, and he was able to ask each one specifically um, what was what each of these was. Um, now, the Twitter executives who were there were um, Vijaya Gadi or Gaddy. Um, general counsel and head of legal policy and trust. Um, she um, led the team that I, as I understand it, Yoel Roth served on, former head of trust and safety. Mm -hmm. uh, we also had James Baker, former deputy counsel, who obviously worked for Miss Miss uh, Gaddy, and uh, he was the f also before that former general counsel for the FBI. He actually uh, left under a cloud there and faced charges for. Um, Behavior that was less than desirable. Um, and then there was also uh, Annika Collier Navarali, I think is how you say her name, former policy official on the team assigned to Twitter's content moderation. Now, Navarali had left Twitter um, actually before a lot of this had happened. She was there because she was the whistleblower on, or quote unquote, whistleblower on uh, the January 6th stuff. She had advocated for. Um, for booting Donald Trump off of Twitter before January 6th and has made the case in public um, that uh, the riots or the um, insurrection would never have mm -hmm. happened if Twitter had, had, had banned Donald Trump sooner. <laughs> you know, the biggest, the biggest whistleblower in this whole story is Elon Musk. He spent 40 right. plus bil billion dollars to buy a company and then whistleblow everything that's going on in it and bring it to light. So, uh, I think he, he's a hero to a lot of people of just coming out with transparency, right? We want to see what actually takes place. There's so many things that hit the news reel every day. And now, because of everything that's happened pretty much since COVID, everyone kind of in the back of their minds thinking, okay, is this real? Or how do I dissect all of this news that's coming in? And so now you're seeing these Twitter files released. And uh, man, it, it is, it is pretty, pretty jarring. Well, it is, you know, to, to look back and uh, the Sentinel has covered this. You can check it out in writing um, at republicsentinel.com. Um, but the, the story surrounding the New York Post headline was um, they're breaking um, <clears throat> the story itself of Biden's laptop, Hunter Biden's laptop. It had been floating around out there for uh, nearly a year. Um, and finally, after a lot of research, the New York Times, or excuse me, the New York Post um, released the story demonstrating uh, that there was strong evidence of collusion between not only Hunter, but Joe mm -hmm. and different Russian uh, operatives, especially on the business side. And so this was two weeks before the 2020 election. This was mid-October. Um, the very next day, and this, this is part of the record, the very next day, 
um, you saw Yoel Roth and the rest of the um, Twitter team that managed um, whether what they were going to turn off, what they were going to um, do not ampli- amplify is the way they said it, but shadow ban. Now, they were, during the hearing, they were very uh, careful to say, well, that's not how we would define shadow ban because uh, Jack Dorsey had been before another um, committee and had testified that there was no shadow ban. Now, you can define shadow ban creatively, but if we're telling people, um, if we're putting a, a marker on their, um, on their account that says people can't see this, we're going to limit the number of people who can see this, and we're not telling them that we're doing it, I'm not sure what the shadow ban, what the definition of shadow ban would be if that's not it. Yeah, and um, I think Jack, I think Jack Dorsey has to be brought in and yeah. re reexamined because let me tell you something. If you're the CEO of a company, you you should and you do know everything that's going on. I could take this to sports when the Houston Astros were cheating in 2017. The the then president and owner had said he had no idea what was going on. I find that highly impossible that you don't know something as deep as that is going on. Uh, yeah. We had cloud iCloud servers where the FBI and Twitter execs could talk privately. It was like this magic backdoor room is what Jim Jordan explained it as. Right. And they were just sending over, hey, d- don't, don't show this, take this down. Um, how is that legal? Well, the problem is that ultimately there are, there are two things going on. <clears throat> you can make the argument strongly that it is a violation of the First Amendment for mm-hmm. government officials to flex their power and, and either collude with or require um, private companies to execute um, that kind of order in which we are limiting people's speech. Mm-hmm. Um, you, I tend to agree with those who, who say that, um, and who point out, that it's not a violation of free speech for a, for a private company to do so on its own initiative. Um, we should know that they're doing it, and we should be free to stop uh, participating. Mm-hmm. Um, but in this case, despite the repeated, I don't know, I don't remember, I wasn't there for that, I, don't, and I wasn't there for that conversation, even though some of the conversations were, <laughs> were in writing, yeah, and have we have the records it. now. We have the emails, and we have uh, the references to the to private chats. We even have some of the chats. Apparently, mm-hmm. um, there was there was a lot of dancing um, uh, around the issue. But ultimately, yes, you absolutely have, uh, especially uh, a few FBI agents um, putting pressure on Twitter, and Twitter being more than happy. The morning after uh, the New York Post posted their uh, Hunter Biden story two weeks before the election, Yoel Roth was all over his email looking for every single loophole that possible to limit mm-hmm. that story. Um, and to the extent that, uh, I mean, it's, it's obvious that in, in, that, you know, in his current attitude now, before Congress, his attitude did change. Um, and, you know, you, does that mean he's actually changed? Or does that just mean he's sorry he was caught and was mm-hmm. trying to get away? Well, you know, we'll, we'll leave that for others to decide. Um, yeah, I think the Republicans this, were frustrated. I think you well, had, yes, I mean, you, saw, yeah. you saw the Republican from Florida, Anna Paulina Luna, who, said, who asked this, do you remember yeah. communicating on a private cloud server with government entities to remove a posting? Yes or no? And Roth says, I don't believe I can give you a yes or no answer. And she just returns, <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you right now, you did it. It's highly illegal. I think yep. they were just frustrated that they were dancing around. They couldn't answer anything. Uh, all under oath, the evidence right. is there. It's hard. It's if it's a conversation that was had in, in private, we don't know what was said. We weren't in the room. But when you have emails showing these backdoor servers using, uh, or entity like the FBI using backdoor servers to talk to Twitter execs, and and even deeper than that, ex FBI officials working on Twitter's board and helping them in their company, man, it, it just seems like a collusion on a highest level. Yes, it does, and you'll notice that. The Democrats on the committee, um, and that includes AOC, um, were very lighthearted, mocking, and just, just laughing at the proceedings until we got down to pointing out that uh, Roth was directly evading a question and there was evidence on the screen. And that's when they threw a fit and started making points of order and crying about decorum and witness threatening and mm-hmm. witness intimidation. Um, and so... Even though the the chair did a reasonably good job of of, of pointing out that's that's Representative Comer, 
Uh, mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry that that's not he, what he said was, well, we have different opinions on what uh, witness intimidation is. Um, so, you know, the the ultimate reality on the one side is that you've got this question of uh, the violation of the First Amendment. But you also have a major question as to whether or not Twitter crossed the line into making uh, what would amount to in-kind uh, campaign contributions to the Biden campaign by tamping down that story and by completely limiting it before the election. Um, and that's where uh, Representative Byron Donalds really um, drilled into um, when he uh, asked the questions of Yoel, did anybody at Twitter have any contact with anybody at the DNC, the mm -hmm. Democratic National Committee? Uh, and Roth says, I think it's likely that somebody at Twitter did, yes. And Donald says, in, in these emails, it's listed, these are the tweets I hate to be flagged from Biden from the Biden's team. That's what the files say. You have no idea how many people actually engaged with the Twitter team or how frequently they engaged and th that happened. Ross says no, and again, that was by design. We kept those functions separate from content moderation so that we could impartially assess reports. So he's trying to make the argument that the communication with the Biden team and with the DNC, which is public fact, um, it was firewalled from those who were making decisions as to whether, you know, as to what things would be limited. The reason that doesn't work very well is because we have tweets from Roth on his own account at the same mm -hmm. time claiming that the Trump White House was full of Nazis, that the that Trump himself was a Nazi and that they were all Nazis. Well, that's not very impartial. You can't claim to be impartially assessing reports when you are taking that kind of position and showing that kind of impartiality. I mean, um, you, had, so, you had sitting members of Congress that were banned. You had Bobert, you had uh, right. Marjorie Taylor Greene, right. and they represent a large constituent in their in their state, and their people were not getting right. the information that they wanted from Twitter. And some people use Twitter as their news feed. They don't want to watch the the local news. They don't want to. They want to see Twitter because you get everything live. Right? You know, it's boom. You hear every story. Um, yep. And I, and I think you what you did is you silence a party. And you allowed another party to have all of the information coming out. So there's only one side of the story. And I always tell my kids, there's two sides to every story. So when they come in from outside and one's screaming and crying and the other one's looking like she did something, there's her story and there's the other one's story. Right. You have to hear both of them. You can't just hear one-sided stories. Yep. And by limiting one side, and there was, it, you can't deny that there was an effort to limit the Republican perspective. Mm -hmm. Now, I joke about the fact that I've spent my entire career working for and against the Republican Party. That's because I don't believe the Republicans actually stand for what they say they believe. No, they don't. I don't believe Mitch McConnell is going to save us. I don't believe Kevin McCarthy actually cares about uh, the, the liberties and freedoms of the people of the United States. He was forced to care, um, and uh, we're excited about that. But that's the reality. And so, you know, this is not, a, this is not an R versus D question, but it is a question of... Um, one side being given more leeway and being given more access and the ability to, to communicate their perspective. This is like a, a TV station or a radio station absolutely flaunting the equal access rules, which are required. Um, you know, if we're going to, if we're talking about a federal election, you can't have a TV station saying, well, we're only going to sell ads to one party or we're mm -hmm. only going to provide airtime to one side. It goes so even deeper. That's exactly deeper. what's going on. Yeah, it goes even deeper to that. Do you remember when this all started to go down? What did we have? We had Dan Bongino start Parler. You had Gab start coming out. And what were they facing? They were facing being able to have servers to put them out. Oh, yeah. they, were, they weren't even allowed to, to create something for a neutral. But they weren't silencing Democrats on those platforms. They were just saying, hey, there has to be a neutral platform where we can have both sides and tell both sides of the story. Like whatever happened to just back and forth conversations, right? If I don't have to agree with you on everything, but let's talk about it. Let's let's stay the facts. And like uh, uh, Ben Shapiro said so many times, <laughs> my feelings, you know, my facts don't have any feelings. So uh, right. we have to get back to the point where it's you hear both sides, both arguments, both parties. You can't silence one to prop up the other one. The Hunter Biden story, that's a big deal. Coming down to an election two weeks before an election, and in, there's in which collusion with Russia was a major point. Yeah, and which and, we have to remember, and and especially the hypocrisy of the left and of the Democrat um, machine claiming that it was Trump while their candidate was himself implicated. 
And then the FBI comes out after the New York Post articles taken down, they're banned from Twitter. They say, this has Russian collusion written all over it. Right. Wow, that's, that's the audacity of them to know what they were doing in light of that the people, the FBI should be on trial right now. Yep. Well, and that's where um, you have James uh, Baker, James A. Baker, who is uh, still connected with the FBI, even though it was investigated, and still was offered um, security clearance uh, to review things um, that otherwise the FBI could not release under security laws. And so obviously they had a relationship with him. Mm-hmm. At one point, uh, Representative Donalds asks, let me ask you a separate question. I'll ask this of you too, Mr. Baker. Have you guys been able to quantify the amount of in-kind contributions associated with taking down the New York Post story? Because New York Post story was down for two weeks, give or take. Mm-hmm. Do you have any understanding of how much that story was limited by Twitter and also by other social media companies? What's the impact of an in-kind contribution that would be to the Joe Biden presidential election in 2020? Now, we have to understand um, that under FEC rules, the amount, uh, uh, the total contribution amount that could come from a corporation is 100 bucks. Mm-hmm. That's the question. And what Mr. Baker says, I don't know the answer to that question, sir. <laughs> yeah. That's... So a little later on, he asked, do you think it's more than the maximum contribution to a campaign? Baker says, I don't, I don't want to speculate. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Now, look, in a proceeding like this, no one is required to uh, give evidence against themselves. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Baker's working very hard to not perjure himself, even though I believe he may have later on in the discussion when he claimed attorney-client privilege that probably yep. doesn't exist. Um, but in this case, Donald's point is is well made. Now, it would have been nice had he come back and pointed out that, look, this is, this is how this works. Um, but we'll do it. Ultimately, um, you can't have a corporation playing one side under current campaign finance laws. Now, if we want to change those laws and let corporations play for whichever side they want to play, we can have that discussion. Mm -hmm. But it's the Democrats who have pushed not to allow corporations to function that way, to limit the speech of corporations. Constitutionally questionable from my perspective, but that is their perspective. But when it comes to playing for their side, of course that's what they want to do, and they've done it for a long time. That's the way unions work. That's the way they have this set up, so -hmm. that they can use the power, the financial power of corporations and of businesses to support their side. That's exactly what's happening here. And a lot of people thought the whole Hunter Biden laptop was this smear campaign on on Joe Biden's family with Hunter, and he's a drug addict and all these awful things. But it goes a lot deeper than that. There was evidence on there in emails to uh, corporations in China that, you know, the big guy. And so there was a lot of implications that Joe was actually getting paid from China, from companies in China, and that there was a... uh, (laughs) I, I, a president running, a guy running for president for the United States in collusion with China doesn't bode very well for election votes. And I, and I think that was the biggest reason why it wasn't to, to, to protect Hunter. They, I don't think they cared. I think Joe would sell out his own son. Um, that's the type of Clearly. person I, I believe he is. But, and just like Joe's getting sold out by his own party now, and you're seeing them search more for files in his house and in, in other areas. But this was a bigger story than just a drug addict son who has a lot of issues that, you know, needs help. But there was business implications of him taking money from a foreign power, a foreign power that we are pretty much against and on the brink of war with with them and Russia. So uh, this is so much deeper than just the smear campaign. It is. Um, House Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer uh, summarized it this way before the hearing. In the run-up to the 2020 presidential election, Big Tech and the Swamp colluded to censor reporting about the Biden family's shady business schemes. The U.S. Intelligence Committee and the FBI frequently communicated with Big Tech and advised Twitter executives to question the validity of any Hunter Biden story before the New York Post ever reported on it. We also know members of Twitter's top censorship team debated how they could justify limiting the spread of the story. They landed on a policy that even some among them doubted. Now, this is based on um, the communications that were released in the Twitter files. There is nothing here that that I could see anyone legitimately disagreeing with. 
Mm -hmm. Um, now the Democrats can say, well, you couldn't prove it. Well, yeah. When you have a witness who who says, I don't know, I can't recall. Yeah. You're not going to get anywhere with that witness, but that's not what we're talking about. We have, this is the information that's available to the public that both sides get to comb through. Um, so that's the reality. Do you think this is the major reason why everyone was against Elon Musk buying Twitter? Um, that's a good question. I think that some people certainly saw that this could could happen. I don't know if anybody actually thought Elon would do it, but when you watch how he functions, you can't predict what he's going to do. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's a big part of it. I think you also have, um, you know, like uh, Business Insider was a major critic, uh, um, critic of Musk um, and mm-hmm. became a critic when he started talking about buying Twitter. And they have ceaselessly hammered every negative detail they could find about him. Do I think they're colluding to keep Joe Biden in the White House? Maybe, but they are leftists with money who don't want to see the other side get money. And they mm-hmm. don't want to see the other side use their money. Sure. And so I think that that's true, but I think it, 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 there are a lot of reasons, um, and all of which I think are good. Now, you know, there's certainly areas where I disagree with Musk. Um, it's important to note that he is not the savior of the world. He's not the no. savior of America. He's an interesting dude. Um, but we have some areas of agreement. We agree uh, in our uh, assessment of free speech. Mm-hmm. We agree about many aspects of liberty and freedom. Uh, even though we may disagree on some aspects of personal morals and personal liberty and freedom. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I respect and appreciate what Musk is, did at Twitter and is still doing, um, even though he has turned his attention elsewhere. Um, it was also extremely entertaining. I, I have to admit that. Yeah, I, you know, Elon Musk just came out and spoke out against world government, said it would, it would collapse. It could lead to a civilization collapse. And I think he sees it. I think he sees what happened. You, if you have one world power and it's one party and no one has a say and you're just told what to do, you're living in a communist country and a communist world. Uh, you've lost your freedoms, right. you've lost your property, you've lost your liberty. And that's where we are headed unless there is a drastic change, I believe, in, in government and in local government and also with these big tech companies uh, working one side and not you know, letting out the news of both. Well, that's exactly right. Um, you know, I think it's also important to recognize that while the United States House of Representatives is currently controlled by Republicans who are willing to, um, to do many things that we've wanted done for a long time, um, mm-hmm. they are not America's saviors either. Um, and it's a lot of fun to watch what the House is doing now, a lot of fun to watch hearings like this, to watch other good committees be established. Um, it's, it's, very, it's more than fun. It's wonderful. It's excellent to see um, outstanding representatives like Thomas Massey and Chip Roy be appointed to the um, calendar and rules committee, um, which is what affects and changes how um, bills come to the House. Uh, After working in Congress for decades uh, as a lobbyist and as a grassroots coordinator nationwide as we pushed different initiatives, and yes, I know being a lobbyist is probably worse than being a lawyer. You'll have to pardon me for that. Uh, But we worked for years to try to get um, our conservative congressman to stand up and do what um, people finally did in the McCarthy speaker vote. And Mm -hmm. we worked for years to overcome the problems with the Rules Committee. Unless you actually have a voice on that committee, you don't get to do anything because the Rules Committee decides not only what bills come to the floor, but what amendments will be able to be offered to those bills and who will get to talk. And so it, it, it exercises complete control, and that committee is, of course, appointed by the Speaker. So for decades upon decades, Republicans have used that ability to simply quash those who care about liberty and freedom. So let's not pretend, and to be clear, uh, Kevin McCarthy was in the middle of all of that for years and years mm-hmm. and years. Um, and so because... Um, Chip Roy and others were willing to stand up and say, no, we are not going to let you do it this time. And because of the unique um, dividing line between Republican and Democrat in the House, um, we actually had the opportunity to force them to do this. And that is why they're doing it. They're doing it because they're forced to do so. Um, there is, there's not, that's, that's what's going on. 
Um, so there is no way um, we can sit here and say, great, I am so happy that uh, we have um, a Republican majority in the House. Not really. Not really. That doesn't mean much. I am very excited that that Republican majority is now being forced to do what it should do the whole time. That is Mm -hmm. practice what they preach. Republicans get elected year after year after year by saying, we believe in liberty and freedom. We believe in limited government. We believe in the Second Amendment. We believe in free speech. We believe in the right to life. And yet they would get to Congress and do what Congress critters do. It it, it comes down to one word, accountability. And now they're being held accountable to what they ran on, what their platform was. Um, And I think, you know, you had so many Republicans. Dan Crenshaw came out against what these Freedom Caucus uh, members were doing. And I I was shaking my head because I I saw him a couple years ago be so bold. And I was like, man, this guy is going to be the new face of the Republican Party. And then (laughs) you see him flip flop and you're like, oh, my goodness, like, yeah, he's in now he's in. So he's lost his values and is going into the swamp with everyone else. And this Freedom Caucus was holding them accountable, said, no, we need to make changes. I mean, you had Matt Gates literally saying term limits from a guy who's sitting there who could Matt Gates could be in politics for 40, 50 more years because of his age. And, you know, you have guys like Grassley and Lindsey Graham and Mitch McConnell. Those guys should be out. I mean, yeah. But it's it, there's got to be term limits. There's got to be accountability. If you ran on a platform, or you ran by your pro life, your pro Second Amendment, your pro speech, uh, free speech. You you have to hold to it, and someone's got to hold you to it because people have not figured right. out yet that the voting is so powerful that the voters are the ones that are in charge. You work, politicians work for voters, and you know you've taught me through the local magistrate and local politics that you can vote people out. It's amazing. You don't have to vote for the same person just because they have an R next to their name. Uh, you can find people to run. And that's what I think America's starting to figure it out. You have a lot of people who were told for a long time, politics is here, you're down here, you're not smart enough to be in politics. And uh, I believe in Pennsylvania, wasn't a truck driver just elected this past year? He, I think he spent $25 in a bet and he, and he bought donuts for like a, a trucker rally or something. Like <laughs> I that's do what we're getting. That story. Americans, I did win. That's the American story. Like you have a, you have a goal set and you go out and you, and you achieve it and whatever it takes. And I think people now are starting to see that. Well, I, I certainly agree that the importance of, uh, I agree with the importance of getting involved, especially in your local government and working your way into more important stuff. You and I will have to debate uh, the value of term limits, which would be super fun. <laughs> oh boy. Well, I know you'll win that cause I'm not there with you. <laughs> No, I think it'll be a good discussion. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Samuel Say, who is a regular contributor at The Sentinel. Um, He is a Ghanaian Canadian who currently lives in Ohio, committed to addressing racial, cultural, and political issues with biblical theology. Uh, He contributes regularly to The Daily Wire, to Christian Post, The Blaze, with Ali Stuckey, uh, the Alyssa Childers podcast, and and many other places. Um, Samuel, thanks for coming on today. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me. You know, uh, it was interesting to watch uh, the uh, reruns of the Super Bowl. I have to admit that I didn't watch the Super Bowl. I really don't care too much <laughs> about football. It's not a political protest. I just yeah. never really have watched it. Um, but it was interesting to get caught up the next day and to see some of the responses to the quote-unquote black national anthem. Yeah. Um, a lot of different uh, opinions from a lot of different people there. And uh, we wanted to get your take on it and uh, just give you a chance to to speak on it. Yeah, it, the whole thing is really fascinating to me um, for so many reasons. One is, well, one, I'm, I'm, an, uh, I'm a new immigrant to America. Um, and I definitely do not want two uh, national anthems. <laughs> I want just one. It'll make it a lot easier <laughs> on me. Um, but the whole issue with the so-called black national anthem is, uh, it was adopted as such, um, I think around 1917, by the um, by the NAACP. I always I'm always careful to say NAACP because to me, I used to be a wrestling fan. I always want to say NWO, uh, but it's not, not, not NWO. <laughs> it's uh, anyway. I'll, <laughs> but um, yeah, it was it was a, they they adopted it as a black national anthem in 1917, and it made sense kind of at the time. Um, 
one, the um, from what I understand, the the Star Spangled Banner was not really adopted you know, um, as the anthem um, till 1931, I think, uh, was the mm-hmm. case. And also, you had segregation at the time as well, too. So it made sense that you would have, from their point of view, anyways, a you know two different anthems. But now mm-hmm. that segregation is over. Now that the the vast majority of Black Americans do not want um, two national anthems, it, the whole thing is silly. And of course, it's the NFL just trying to virtue signal because of what's been going on, uh, you know, in the league for the last several years. And this is just going to lead to more division, even amongst Black people. Um, mm-hmm. So it's just also absurd. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been so strange because really in many ways it's a fake controversy because, again, the average black American does not want, um, you know, two uh, uh, national anthems anyways. Yeah, Samuel, well, I, 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 uh, I, I played baseball and, you know, I'm with you on the two anthems. When we used to play the Blue Jays, we'd have to listen to the Canadian anthem and then the American <laughs> anthem. And uh, it's a long, it's a long uh, three, four minutes, but... You know, I, I want to go back to 9-11 when we had uh, a horrific thing that happened here. Sports World stopped, baseball stopped, it was getting close to the postseason, and the NFL stopped for uh, a week. When we came back from that, it was the most patriotic America you could see. There were football players running on the field with the American flag, black, white, brown. It didn't matter what color you were or race. It You were American. And in 22 years, we've gone the total opposite direction where people are offended by the, Amer- by the national anthem, they're, they're offended by the American flag. Uh, how do you think the sports world recovers from this? How, is it mm. men like you who stand up and, and stop the race baiting and all of that and just get mm. back to being, we are all Americans? Yeah, well one actually, I remember, though I am Canadian, I remember just how the sporting world was like back in, um, 2001 after 9/11, and I'm forgetting who, but I remember there's been this scene again. I'm at the time I, at the time I wasn't American at the time, but I remember being emotional seeing a scene of I think it was a baseball player holding Sammy Sosa. The fl- Sammy, Sammy Sosa. Sosa, yes, Wrigley Field yeah. ran yeah, on the man. field. I watched that recently, and I was choked up. It was gives you chills. It, it, it's beautiful, and mm-hmm. you see what's happening today. You, it, it wouldn't be. It would be controversial for him to do that today, and that's sad. Um, yeah. So, um, in terms of you know um, how the sporting world will will, will um, react to all of this, I think it, I, I think about Ivan Provorov and what happened in the NHL, where mm-hmm. one one person said, "No, I'm not doing this," and then since then the New York Rangers, who are not exactly in the most conservative <laughs> city or state in America. And they ended up foregoing the entire, um, you know, pride jerseys too, because now they realize that it could cause more uh, that Ivan Provorov may have influenced other uh, players to just say, no, they didn't want that kind of controversy. So it really does take some players saying, no, we don't stand for this. Um, mm-hmm. And the same way that some woke NFL players have been one of the reasons why the NFL has adopted the lift every voice or so-called black national anthem, um, it could lead to the NFL or the other uh, sporting leagues also saying, okay, this is just not helpful whatsoever because our players are not happy with this. Yeah, I agree. You know, one of the realities or one of the concerns from my perspective is the messaging um, that we're that we're adopting. And it, to, to one degree or another, you could say that all sides are doing this, but if we're going to say that you have to sing a song in order to participate, or you can't sing a song in order to participate, that that's an ugly thing, and that's not an American perspective. As as you pointed out, um, no one has considered singing a song to be an important part of a national um, a ethos uh, until about a hundred years ago. Yeah. In some cases, less. And so, my perspective. Look, I believe that as an American, I already owe allegiance to my country. That doesn't mean it's to the to the occupants of political offices. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean to my government, but it does mean to my country. Mm-hmm. And so, I strongly believe in reciting the pledge. For example, mm-hmm. I'm also proud to sing the Star Spangled Banner. Now, the history of that goes back another hundred years, um, and to it involves men and women who were here at the founding. Mm-hmm. Um, you can make the same argument for um, the um, Black National Anthem, as it's called. Um, but 
if we're going to say, well, we couldn't sing one and not the other, then what we're saying is we want to, as you've pointed out, we want to regress to uh, some kind, some form of, of segregation. Mm-hmm. That America is not here for black people. Well, yeah, isn't that, it? Isn't it a form of segregation? You're literally saying oh, you're not sure. American, so we're going to play your anthem for you. I think it yeah. it just sends a really bad message out there that hey, this is just for you guys, and then we're going to play one quickly for you. Yeah, yeah. that's not how yeah. it is. Yeah. If you have people who don't want to participate in singing a song, that's fine. I don't have a mm-hmm. problem with that. Mm-hmm. But we also show respect to those who are expressing their love for their country yeah. mm-hmm. in the same way that we wouldn't look away, sit down, turn our backs. Um, let, let's say our ambassador is in, uh, well, pick a country, France. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, you, know, <laughs> you, you hear the Marseilles and our ambassador shows disrespect. That would that would be that would be a major national international yep. incident. It yep. would be a problem. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so what we're what we're saying is number one, we're not one country, and number two, we can't respect one another's perspectives. Yes. Um, yeah. Both of those things are, are are very negative. Yeah, and this is what happens when people choose to have um, so many different identities uh, as a nation, in that when. You know, because of critical race theory and woke ideology, when people see their fellow neighbor as primarily being black or being white instead of just being American, that's what happens then. Because then you have this view then that, um, well, there is a so-called white national anthem, which is ridiculous because Frederick Douglass used to play the Star Spangled Banner on his violin. You know, this is before it was the official anthem. He just loved right. that so much. And he wasn't thinking, oh, yeah, I'm celebrating racism here. Um, <laughs> but but this is what happens, right, when people are so fixated on the issue of race. And really, it's intentional, right? Critical race theorists do want That's to right. divide uh, Americans because they really do believe in racism. They really believe that it's okay for us to be racist against white people, um, or really, or even racist against black people by othering black people by saying, well, you are different. Therefore, you need to have your own things, have your own national anthem. And then have, I mean, even even here in Canada, um, I'm reading about uh, school. I'm saying here in Canada, although I'm in the U.S., but I forget sometimes that um, I'm, I'm still, I'm still, you know, I'm uh, locationally, I'm still trans Canadian, I guess, right? But yeah. anyway, I should probably not get myself in too much more trouble. But, um, but yeah, they, you know, there's a school here that is having uh, counseling sessions for Black History Month just for Black people, um, which is really just against segregation. Um, so there really is a, a weird love for segregation and racism happening in our society today, and it's bleeding out in the sporting world. You know, you say you say a, a really good point there because in, in the culture itself, but it's even coming into the church, right? We're we're seeing black pastors. You know, I, I saw what you responded to Kyle uh, J Howard on on Instagram where you said this is what race idolatry looks like. You're seeing professing Christians where, yes, we're all Americans. doesn't matter if you're white, brown, or black. We're all Americans. But most importantly, we're all created in God's image, right? We're Mm. all from Adam and Eve. And Mm. how do Christians get so far off of that path where they start doing the race baiting and they start start talking about race and and that's all they want to say is there's black and there's white instead of just saying we're all one in God? Yeah. there. I think there's so many reasons for that. One is, and I think... Um, this is uh, my concern for so many so-called white pastors. I hate to even you know, use those you know, silly terms, but is that so many people, um, so many white pastors have said, uh, and some of them personally to me, and they've said, "Look, I'm a white privileged you know, privileged male," and they see they say that our forefathers as Christians, you know, whether it was Edwards or Whitfield, they say they failed when it came to the issue of of racism and white supremacy. Um, and they don't want to repeat that same failure. Therefore, they embrace these views, these woke views, these critical race theory views, thinking they're actually being different from um, uh, Christians in the past who um, were supporting slavery or white supremacy. Uh, mm-hmm. Not that what, uh, Edward uh, necessarily was, was supporting white supremacy. But, but what's interesting about that is People who embrace critical race theory today are repeating the exact same sins that people in the past did because they were really embracing an unbiblical view 
on race or racism or justice. Uh, because to adopt slavery back then was to adopt what the culture was saying about slavery or, again, even the issue of race. Even again, The very idea of race anyways is really an unbiblical concept. Um, we are only one race. Although you can, mm-hmm. you can say two races in a sense, First Peter 2, 9, in that there is a holy race and the unholy race. So I oftentimes say that the white supremacists and the critical race theories are the same race. So it's just mm-hmm. funny that they're going against each other, but really <laughs> they're, they're brothers. Um, <laughs> But that's what's happening with some pastors. But then you have people like Cal J. Howard or other uh, woke people who have found their value in being a, a, a woke black person, which is really a miserable existence. Because as you said, they're not really uh, rejoicing that they're made in the image of God. And that, um, you know, <clears throat> I've been reading, uh, really um, working on a curriculum on the issue of of race, and I've been meditating on, I believe um, it's Hebrews 2, where where the Bible says that Christ um, died for his race, right? That, um, you know, referring to, you know, the, the human race. And I, as I'm, you know, meditating on this, and I'm thinking, well, his race is not the Jews. His race, again, is the human race. So when you embrace a view of race that is not um, that is not influenced by the scriptures, that is not um, uh, biblical, you are really rejecting not just what it means to be made in the image of God, but the reality that Christ died for the human race. So then you lose the gospel, and which is why someone like Carl uh, J. Howard will then uh, I know you didn't read the um, uh, the tweet, but in the tweet he's basically talking about how if you're not woke. Um, you know, if you're not if you're not woke, then any revival uh, that is happening isn't isn't really a true revival. Um, and it's just so um, the whole thing is really concerning to me. Um, and I've been following Cal J. Howard, not to pick on him too much, but I've been following guys like him. And unfortunately, they're becoming more and more radical because eventually um, this will not just divide in terms of how you see um, <clears throat> it won't just divide. Uh, the church in terms of how you see the issue of justice or race, but even how you see the gospel, naturally. Amen. Well, we really appreciate your perspective. Um, and I think that the the importance of focusing on um, the reality of being one race is, is key because that's how the Bible describes it. Mm-hmm. Um, if we are going to say that skin color or uh, other physical features are the defining element, we end up in a world where we encourage people to say, well, there's not someone doing whatever it is that I want to do who looks like me. And mm-hmm. so I'm going to assume that I couldn't do that. Well, would it be possible for a child to assume that because the people I see doing this thing don't look like me, that that I couldn't do it? Well, sure, it would be possible for a, for a child to assume that. But children assume all kinds of things that we teach, you know what, that's wrong. That's that's actually not true. I want to help you understand that you can do this thing. In fact, leftist ideology says that we teach our children, you can do whatever you want. If you want to be, you know, an airplane and you want to grow wings out of your body, then you can probably do that. (laughs) Now, you know, that's the type of thing. It it gets to be that silly, especially if you watch Disney. But it's interesting that you get to one thing. You get to one element of, of skin color. Mm-hmm. or sexual identity. Mm-hmm. And we say that because the people in that case don't look like you, you couldn't do it. Yeah. You can't mm-hmm. do it. We're telling children that you can't. Yeah. So I don't subscribe to the whole you can do whatever you, you can imagine you can do. I can't walk off my de- back deck, which might be 40 feet above the ground, and fly just because <laughs> I want to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I teach my children that, yeah, you don't just step off that railing. Don't stick your head in there. Yeah. Um, but... Why is it that we get to this perspective that if this person doesn't look like you, you couldn't do it? Well, it's because um, we want to have division. Yeah. That's what Marxism is. Yeah. That's, that's the core concept of that, that conflict and then taking advantage of that conflict to institute a new uh, perspective or a new order. Mm-hmm. That's what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Samuel, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it. I know you were just traveling, and I appreciate you jumping on. Thanks also for your contributions to The Sentinel. We look forward to many more, and I'm very excited to hear about your curriculum. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Samuel. God bless. So, Zach, I know Samuel hit on critical race theory, and and we are seeing this throughout the government. Uh, Pete Buttigieg, he uh, 
he made a comment the other day on this forum where he's supposed to be talking about transportation and all this and talking about this Ohio train wreck that let out all these chemicals. But the one point he brought up was that there's too many white workers on construction sites. And uh, a lot of people were scratching their heads, especially me when I read that, because I, I think about Arizona and I think about the fact that I look at construction sites and it's mainly Hispanic. Uh, it's a it's a highly minority uh, profession. And um, for a guy who's supposed to be running our transportation side of things in government, what do you think, how does that creep into government work when we start talking about race right away when people are, are now ingesting fumes from a train wreck, but he doesn't, our, our transportation guy doesn't want to talk about it? Well, the level of climate hypocrisy uh, or the temperature in climate hypocrisy is definitely going up. Um, <laughs> you, there is no question that we only want to talk about some climate realities. There are others we don't want to talk about. And, and I think that belies the falseness behind the entire narrative. So in Ohio, uh, we have a train carrying toxic chemicals, uh, vinyl chloride. Uh, it's derailed and crashed. Look, that's going to happen. Um, but the response from the most environmentally conscious administration in American history, quote unquote, is nothing. We say literally nothing for 10 full days. Meantime, uh, the Department of Defense releases numbers uh, along with the Ohio National Guard, which indicate the best thing to do is to burn this stuff off. Now, we have to understand that the control release involves um, the release of so much toxic material uh, that the governors of Ohio and Pennsylvania, it was right on the border, warned of severe injury, including skin burns and serious lung damage, as well of gra as grave danger of death if you are within range of the fumes. And um, the hope is to burn it off and to release it into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, and then now everyone has probably seen the pictures of uh, what looks like a small uh, Hiroshima um, as the mushroom cloud gro grows into the environment. Um, it's going to come back as something akin to acid rain as this horrible chemical is washed back into the ground and goes into the Ohio River which is going to influence through the Ohio Valley and then the drainage into the Mississippi, about a quarter of the United States. Now, I'm not here to, to say exactly what the environmental fallout is going to be, but if there was a political angle to exploit, do we really think that the Biden administration wouldn't be losing its mind over this? Um, yeah. the, it, it doesn't serve their purposes. So what do we see Buttigieg doing? He's talking about the real problem in America is we need fewer white people in construction. Yeah, that's that, the response. You know, and, and there are some people, um, DC Drano, who is uh, Rhino Hanley. Uh, he he came out and, and showed the Ohio presidential results, and it was Donald Trump had seventy one percent of the vote votes there, and they're trying to tie the whole transportation, blow up these train cars and let this stuff spill out into the air on, they don't care who's there. Uh, there were so many questions that needed to be answered by our transportation guy uh, and, and, he, and he avoided it and it goes right to a race thing where people can be like, oh yeah, you know what? There are a lot of white people in construction. And then you realize, no, no, there's not. And, and he kind of got called out by, I think both sides. And, and it was actually a bipartisan uh, argument where they are actually some Democrats that were pretty, ups Mar. pretty upset about it. Ilhan Omar was very vocal on Twitter uh, saying that this needs to be investigated. Like how, how we're supposed to be green, right? Everyone's talking about green and here we are, we're, we're exploding off cars and, and letting them burn off fuels with that's literally killing animals. Um, whether you want to believe it's from that or not, but all of a sudden these, these house pets are turning up dead. What, People are having health concerns now, uh, a cough and stuff. There were so many things that he could have brought up and talked about, but he goes right to race. Well, it's particularly egregious when we just got off of uh, the Biden administration saying that we need to ban gas stoves because of their emissions inside houses. Mm -hmm. uh, that you that, that we're going to tell you what kind of appliances you can have. Now, what value does that have? You have a federal agency whose job description is to, uh, at least their self-written job description, is to reach into the uh, most... Uh, private part of your home or one of the most private parts your 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 valued uh, kitchen and to tell you which appliances you can and cannot have um, 
And you also see, obviously, we have uh, canceling or, or uh, restricting the permits for the Keystone XL pipeline because mm-hmm. of emissions, right? That's, that's the argument. Um, we also have uh, the administration pushing offshore wind energy for the same reason. And in each of these cases, there, the perspective of federal bureaucrats is it doesn't really matter what other consequences, what bad things might happen. We want what we want. Um, the upshot is, yeah, I'm not sure you want to save the environment. I don't think that's what's actually going on here. Because if that was true, we'd be motivated in, in, in kind of instance like is what, what happened in Ohio to find better ways to do it. Now, I think the reason we see a strong reaction from both the left and the right is because uh, there is a tremendous amount of hypocrisy. But the leftist perspective is that government should be doing all these things. Government should be regulating what stove you can have in your kitchen, for example. Government should be um, turning off uh, gas supply, you know, an oil pipeline, for example. And it doesn't matter if you have to pay more at the pump. Um, I'm not saying that closing Excel uh, actually caused all of it, but um, it is a matter of supply and demand. Mm -hmm. So you can't deny it. Um, and so th- I think that's why you see the left complaining about it, because they want more of this. Um, our perspective, obviously, is that, no, we want less. And this shows that this is not really about what we say it's about. Well, yeah, this it's isn't definitely about- not about conserving our, our world or animals no. or anything else. I mean, the, you bring up that the wind farm was interesting. 38 days ago, they started this uh, geotechnical surveying on the ocean. Within 30, 38 days, seven whales show up Correct. dead. And we're not talking shore. about dolphins or small. We're talking yeah, about large whales. Yeah, we're talking giant whales. whales in New Jersey. And so right. it's, it's, well, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's from that, but come on. <laughs> well, yeah. And the federal regulatory perspective is no, wind farms are too valuable. We can't stop because of a couple of whales. They probably were just going to die anyway. Mm-hmm. This is from agencies which lose their minds. If a fishing vessel, which is attempting to supply food to humans, um, does actually is actually involved in the death of a whale, mm-hmm. and so once again, what is the perspective? And this is the difference between conservation on the one hand, which I agree with, and environmentalism on the other. Mm-hmm. People like to point to Teddy Roosevelt as a great environmentalist. That is not true. Teddy loved to hunt. <laughs> Teddy went out and and shot animals for sport which from my perspective is a legitimate uh, activity. Sure. Um, you can't point to people like that and say, oh, they were environmentalists. No, they were conservationists, which means they wanted to conserve resources for human use. Mm-hmm. That's the difference. Environmentalism today, unfortunately, has nothing to do with conservation. They're not there to conserve. They're there to uh, eradicate. Mm-hmm. We want to we want less humans. We want fewer humans. And if that means, um, for example, abortion... Good. That's their perspective. And if they're honest about it, and some of them are, like Margaret Sanger, and I'm not saying she was environmentally motivated, although that may have been part of it, um, this, is, this is their perspective. Human beings are an evil from their perspective. Human beings are an unmitigated evil. We just need less of them. Yeah, Bill, of, Gates is, Bill Gates has said it live in a TED Talk. We, we have right. population going in the wrong direction. We are well, increasing population. We yeah. need to decrease it. And that sounds great if you live in, in parts of the country where, that are, that are, um, where the population is very intensive. But you come out here where we live in the West, there's a lot of land out here. Man, have you ever um, driven through I, Kansas? I mean, we <laughs> drove through Kansas together. And we really, we, I think that was actually said what it was like, man, look at all this land. Yeah. I mean, Try southern Utah. Yeah. Try most of Arizona. Yeah. It's Try crazy. Nevada. Try the entire uh, upper Midwest. So this idea that there are too many human beings, no, there is too much, um, there is a sinful perspective, and there are two sides to it. One that says, let's just use it all up, and who cares what happens to our neighbors? Mm -hmm. And the other says, let's limit human beings. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, let's get rid of human beings. Biblically, though, what's what's correct? Love for your neighbor. Love for your neighbor, but also be fruitful and multiply, Right. So That's if we're going to be fruitful and multiply, and you can also be, you know, show love to your neighbor. Um, it doesn't mean you burn up everything, and we shouldn't, you know, throw re- we shouldn't recycle and have recyclable bins. And but what it does mean is that the earth was created for us to live in it, and to start limiting humans so that the earth survives is not the intention. I think God 
right. had for it. Certainly not eradicating humans. And no. that's their point, right? And yep. that's what we mean. And that's why I, I agree. God commanded man to use the earth to take dominion and to um, cultivate the earth and to use it for good purposes, mm -hmm. to use it to serve him. Um, that is our perspective, and that is the biblical perspective. And, and because we live in a fallen man. world, because we live in a fallen world, right? We we yes, have to kill animals. Problems. We have to kill animals. We Correct. have to, you know, eat, find food, and well, animals and God, kill each other. Correct. And God commanded, as long as we live in a fallen, sinful world, that's part of the reality, and it's not necessarily pleasant. Mm -hmm. uh, but the claim that somehow, well, if we just don't kill and eat animals, then it will be okay. It's simply not true. And those who are saying, you know what, save the whales, well, at least some of the time, sometimes save whales, are also saying, Abor shout your abortion. Mm -hmm. That's the perspective. And so it is a radical, it is substituting um, a worship of the earth, ultimately, unfortunately, for loving your neighbor. And yeah. that's why we see, you know what, what if you burn off a bunch of vinyl chloride and it has long-term health effects for tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of human beings. Oh, mm -hmm. well, big deal. So what? Unfortunately, that appears to be the perspective because there is not a love for neighbor. The reason to conserve resources is largely to love your neighbor. Sure. If I sit on my deck here and I decide that I'm going to um, I'm gonna shoot my rifle into my neighbor's, neighbor's backyard, that might be a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Because I might strike my neighbor or damage his property. If I decide that I'm going to enjoy setting off fireworks in a dry year and burn down my neighbor's empty lot next to me, or maybe his garden, or burn down his house, that's mm -hmm. a problem. If I decide I'm going to burn dangerous chemicals in my backyard, it's going to affect my neighbors. That is the point of conservationism. Now, we, are, we, we argue that biblically mankind is commanded to take care of the natural world. Mm -hmm. Proverbs says that a righteous man has regard for the life of his animal. That means that we are commanded to treat our, the creation that is given to us under, that is under our control with respect, mm -hmm. because ultimately we didn't make it. We are given yep. it to use and to, to rule and to govern um, in, a, in, in a decent and right manner. Yeah, and I but think that's that why it's so important, you know, what Ilhan Omar was saying that this is going to be an effect for this area for a long time. Where's the national right. media attention? And I right? agree with her in that case. It's 100%. Right. There's no one talking about this. The long-term effects, um, you think of things like Chernobyl or Fukushima uh, with the nuclear disaster. Well, this is one that was literally in a town where they warned the residents to evacuate the governor. Yeah, Levo, you will die. Levo, you will die. You breathe this stuff in, the long-term effects on your lungs and there's people showing signs of it and no one's talking about it in the media. And I find that troubling. And it, it goes back to the earlier segment with Twitter and, and the, the big tech censoring what comes out and what, what's covered. And media is doing that too. Your local, local media is going to cover it. But what right. about the national outcry? What about the, the people Very across little. this country that want to know, hey, what's going on? Because we've had three train wrecks in the last couple of weeks, one in South Carolina and one in Houston recently. Um, and you don't ever hear about these things. Now, they haven't been as catastrophic as the one in right. Ohio, but they burnt off chemicals and then at the same time say, but well, we care about the environment. We want to conserve it. And right. we actually, we're going to close pipelines so that you pay $6 a gallon for gas. Um, it, it's, it's mind boggling. It's frustrating. Uh, every time I go to the gas pump, it's frustrating to know that we could be pumping our own fuel and there's nothing right. wrong with it. God doesn't forbid gas for your car. We, I saw a study, Zach, a few years ago that said if America went green entirely, we went all electric cars, we would not do anything to the carbon print because of countries like India and China with what they do in their productions. Right. Well, and that's assuming that there would be a smaller carbon footprint if we use electricity. Yeah. You have to burn something to create electricity. That's right. And until our nuclear energy catches up to the rest of the modern world and we use a fuel that does not create a 10,000-year environmental hazard, we're going to have a problem with that. It's not going to happen anytime in the next 30 to 40 years. How so do the they make those batteries? How do they make those batteries for Tesla cars? Exactly. How do they make the solar panels? How do they... You're they using, enslave people. And they they yeah. enslave people. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, the people who are mining the rare earth metals to go into those batteries live in some of the worst conditions imaginable. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that's always the case, 
but there is a brutal disregard for people. Mm-hmm. That's the point. Radical environmentalism isn't doesn't just not it isn't that they just don't care about people. They hate people. Yeah, and it's just, it's really it's the it goes back to even the likes of the NBA and the whole democracy and this and and all of their shoes and china are made there and these yes. people are slaves to nike and all these companies these big shoe companies for dollars on you know a dollar an hour wage uh we need to care more about people than what we what we are showing right now publicly uh we we have such a disregard to human life as you can see with the abortion argument um People are more worried about the environment and trees and animals. I, I, there was a Super Bowl ad on animals, uh, you know, protecting them and, and abuse. And I, I agree, we should not abuse animals. I think there should be a, a foundation that protects animals. But if you had that same commercial about abortion, <laughs> about abortion. I mean, AOC blew <laughs> her, her head on our $20 million com- ad that a, a company took out on a Jesus commercial. She lost her head. And right. I don't Which know. Really I, I, the I commercial wasn't that great. Com- <laughs> it wasn't that great. I think the theology was really bad in it. Um, the slogans are, are piffy, as Jeff would say, piffy slogans that, you know, don't really mean anything. But if you had an abortion commercial on there and showed exactly what it was, people would blow their minds. And we're talking about the most vulnerable of all of the children in the womb. Uh, it's that's where we are as a country. And then that's where. That, that's why, you know, men have to stand up and, and fight and women have to stand up and, and speak out. And it's just, it, it's a sad state. Yes, it is. You know, the, uh, the, when we look at why does it matter? Why should we care whether or not the environmental uh, world wants to er- eradicate humans or protect resources for the use of humans? Mm-hmm. Well, do you like living in a country in, in which the government can't simply arrest you and d- take you where they want to go. Do you, do you want to live in a country where government cannot say, well, you're of a certain ethnic background, so we're just going to wipe you out? Mm-hmm. Um, we can look at times in which our own country failed to protect different uh, groups. That mm-hmm. did happen. That yeah, has absolutely. happened in the past. Uh, and no one says otherwise. The reality is that in the United States of America, we have a framework on which to say, wait a minute, that's wrong, and we need to change that. We need to not do that. It does need to be pointed out that it's been a while. Mm -hmm. It's been a while, and there are still problems that need to be dealt with, Um, but if you want to deal with them, then you have to look at it from a a perspective that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And if the environmental, the radical environmental perspective is true, then human beings are no different from any other animal and have no more value, and from their perspective, have less value because we're destroying the earth. Mm -hmm. That's the perspective. Well, I'm sorry, that's not an American perspective, and it's not a biblical perspective. Our founding documents establish the value of the individual. And if you like having rights then you have to recognize where do those come from? Well, according to the Declaration of Independence, they come from God, the God Mm -hmm. of the Bible. And so we can't on the one hand say, oh, well, we just, we we only want a secular, we only want a a secular existence. Well, if that, by that we mean the institution of the church should not control the state, oh, we agree. That's what separation of church and state means. But if we mean that the institution of government should be separate from the influence of uh, the creator of the universe, and that uh, government itself should be able to determine what is right and what is wrong, uh, that's called tyranny. It's called genocide. Um, And so you can't say on the one hand, we hate America and we hate humans, and on the other hand say, but you, I should be safe in my own home. Mm It doesn't work that way. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We'll look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.